Hello. This video is going to be the first in a series that will look at material balance applied to oil and gas fields. It's a very powerful method for using production data to understand how much oil and gas we have underground and to predict what might happen in the future. And it's entirely based on the production data and the fluid properties. It's not in any way actually linked or should be linked, but it's not in any way using geological information. Okay, so it's a completely complementary approach from analyzing the geology. So what I'm going to do in this first sequence is look at material balance as applied to gas field. Uh, then we're going to look at a gas field with an aquifer, and then we're going to extend it to oil field material balance. But in this section, we're just going to look at a gas field. So what I will do is I will bring up the whiteboard so that we can write down the equations. Okay, so here, here I have my whiteboard, and I'm going to start with my cartoon of the reservoir. So here we have my uh, cartoon, okay, and that will be a reservoir, and that's a contact between here gas, okay, and here will be water, so there won't be uh, this here. Um, as I said, I'm looking at a gas field. There's not going to be an, any oil present for this particular analysis. We will extend it um, later. Okay, so this will be uh, what happens initially. So this is when I've discovered my field. Okay, so I can imagine I drill a well through here. Okay, and the important thing is that we're going to have a pressure PI, an initial pressure I for initial and associated with that will be fluid properties, of which the most important in this analysis is BGI. And that's the gas formation volume factor that I've introduced previously. Okay. So that's the conversion between a reservoir volume and a surface volume. So the first thing we do, and this is what material balance is all about, it's about imagining what's underground, imagining that what's underground went to the surface, and then often putting it back down again. So imagine that we have this gas underground. What is the volume of gas? Right? And I'm going to use uh, G, big G. Whoops. That. Okay. So I'm going to use G to represent the volume of gas. Well, we've used this equation before to look at the amount of um, oil. It's the gross rock volume, it's the total volume of rock that might contain gas, times a porosity, because not all of that uh, rock um, is pore space, times the net to gross, because not a, all, of the, all of the rock could actually produce gas, so it's exactly the same as what we've done before. We then have water also present in the pore space, even where there's gas, so SGI is the initial gas saturation. So this represents the volume of gas underground. I've written that G at the top. What's at the top is supposed to represent surface conditions. When I bring all of this gas to the surface, in, this is a theoretical construct because I'm not going to produce everything, but if I were to produce everything to the surface, then I'd have to divide by BGI. And BGI, remember, is a reservoir divided by surface volume, so this gives me a surface volume. So G is the initial gas in place. So you can actually write that. Okay, so it's the gas version of stoic. Okay. Now, what material balance does is it looks at production data. So we start producing our field. So we should have exactly the same picture here. My drawing isn't uh, terribly good. So uh, the gas field hasn't by some mysterious process changed shape or anything. It's supposed to look exactly the same. So we've got water and gas and we've still got our well. Okay? And we have been producing gas now. And we measure how much gas we produce. We always do that because we're going to sell it. Okay, so the amount of gas produced is GP, P for produced. And the pressure will be some lower value, P, okay? and the gas formation volume factor will therefore be some different, higher value in this case, because there's actually less of a difference between reservoir surface conditions, 
and B of G. Okay, so imagine um, all the gas that's now underground were to be brought to the surface. Um, we could use the um, more or less the same equation as before, couldn't we? We could write V by net to gross. The gas saturation, and this is critical, we're going to relax that assumption. Here, what happens is we drill a well and the gas just expands. And we'll assume it is indeed a gas field, not a gas condensate or anything. So we've already discussed this under fluid phase behavior. What you should do is you should just let the pressure drop. Okay, there's nothing else to do. So we're not displacing the gas in any way in the reservoir. Um, so we'll keep the saturation the same. And then the only thing that's changed is BG. Okay. So that's how much gas we have underground if it were to be taken to the surface. This is a surface volume. As I said, we're, we generally want to look at surface volumes. Okay, well, that, that's fine. But what, what, what does that equal? So, so far, I've just been basically going around in circles. I'm going to invoke material balance now by saying, well, we know what uh, this number is. It's going to be what we had originally minus what I've produced. And then I also said one thing right at the onset was, was the nice thing about this analysis or a feature of this analysis is that it doesn't depend on any um, geological information. You think, well, doesn't matter, you've just written these equations with V and phi net to gross. How do you know those? Well, you can either, the two approaches, you either estimate V phi net to gross SGI um, because you have a seismic survey, you know the extent of the field, you found the locations of the contacts, you know when the well actually went through the top of the field, um, you measure phi and the net to gross either from log measurements or from taking samples directly from the subsurface. You can estimate that number so you can actually predict how much you expect to produce as you drop the pressure. BGI right, is something that um, you have measured uh, from gas samples taken from the field. But the other approach is, in fact, to eliminate all the geological type terms from the equation. So you can see here that V phi net gross SGI is GBGI. So you can actually write this. And then there's a BG. So now we get an equation that looks like this. And the advantage of this equation, which I'm now going to sort of emphasize because it's the uh, key equation of this video, the advantage of this equation is it gives me a prediction of how much gas I produce simply as a, fa as a factor, as a function of how the gas essentially expands as I drop pressure. And that's something I can measure in the laboratory from fluid samples that are taken out of the gas field before I even started producing. So it's something I know, and I need to emphasize this, these aren't, BGs aren't some sort of mysterious object that you don't know where they come from. They have been measured in a lab. You are given a table with those numbers, okay? So it gives you a prediction if you know G, okay? So if you had estimated G, but you can invert it, you can put it the other way around. If I've measured GP, if I've actually measured how much gas I produced, and I do measure the pressure at the well, I can put a pressure transducer at the well, so I can measure the pressure. If I know GP is a function of pressure, um, I can use that to find well, what G, what gas in place will actually, um, you know, once I match the um, equation. So this is, this is my equation. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise everything else now because I will need to do some other, um, write some other equations. Okay, so if you don't mind, I'm going to actually erase all of this. Okay, but I'm going to keep this one, say key equation. And the reason why I'm going to keep this equation and play with it is the way in which it is normally analyzed is with a different type of analysis. So I'm gonna talk about that now. Okay. So, oops, I don't need to do it in red anyway. Okay, so we can have what's called a P over Z or a P over Z plot. We might say, well, what's P over Z got to do? What is it even is Z? So I'm just gonna remind you 
if you recall in a previous video sequence we um, introduced the non-ideal gas law okay so pv is nrt that's the ideal gas law and that works fine for gases at ambient conditions so atmosphere very temperatures and pressures deep underground in a reservoir where we're at hundreds of atmospheres pressure this doesn't work the, the molecules are beginning to sort of want to say interact well they are interacting with each other and so you just put in a fudge factor which is z so often in terms of measuring phase behavior rather than plotting bg directly or reporting bg which is a perfectly respectable thing to do um, instead you often report the the z factor or if in the united states the z factor and that z factor encapsulates all the fluid phase behavior. I mean, it's just a convention. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing fundamental about that. So often this equation that I've got highlighted, you know, with the uh, red circle is in fact written in terms of this um, Z factor. So let's, let's actually do, do that first. So we can see that the volume that you occupy is Z N R T over P. And I'm gonna do this quickly because we've already done this in class, then BG right, is a reservoir volume divided by a surface volume. So the reservoir volume is Z N R T in the reservoir divided by the pressure in the reservoir, which I'm just going to call P because I just called it P here. Okay? And then it's going to be divided by the surface volume. Z is, is one N R T at the surface, P at the surface. And then the N and the R cancel out. Okay, and so we end up with a Z and then a ratio of temperatures and a ratio of pressures. Okay. So that's my BG. And so when I write the equation here, it's G one minus a ratio of these BG factors. Now, the thing you notice here with the BG factors, okay, is um, there's a temperature here and a surface pressure. They're clearly going to cancel out. And in fact, the temperature in the reservoir doesn't change as I produce the gas. I think I've said this already. The rock has a large heat capacity. You're simply withdrawing fluids. You're not doing anything to change the temperature. So the temperature is going to stay the same. The only thing that varies is actually the pressure and the Z factor. And so BGI. Right, the things that's going to vary is Zi over Pi. And then Bg, it's one over Bg, so the P, P goes to the top. And the Z goes to the top. Okay. So it is simply a convention that we write this equation um, in terms of Z factor. And so you get one minus Zi over Pi times P over Z, right? that's, that, that's that ratio. Now you might say, okay, well that's, um, that's fine. I still don't get this P over Z plot. Um, you know, what's, what's the plot that we're going to, 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 to do? So now I'm going to, again, just erase some of the material here so that um, we have some room just to show how we go about this. Okay, so now let's imagine that we have some pressure data so, and some production data. So what the, how material balance works is as follows. The how material balance works as follows is you've discovered a field and what you can write here is you can write the pressure. Oops, I'm losing the pressure. You can write a calculation then of your Z factor or your BG. Okay, and you can write down how much gas you've actually produced. Okay, so imagine a sort of table like this. Okay, so your first value will be your initial pressure. You have your fluid properties that have been measured, and that's your initial Z and the amount of gas you produced is zero. And then what happens over time, as you start producing, so maybe every month or every six months, you record the pressure. Indeed, you can often record the pressure every few seconds in a reservoir, so that's not uh, such a big, big problem. 
you've got your Z values, and you've got whatever value you have for GP. Okay, so that's GP. So this will be a list of numbers. It's not just one number, it's gonna be a list of numbers, okay? So then um, what do you do with that data? Well, you're gonna plot it. So I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to sort of get rid of um, that just to, just to make some space. So what you do is you find you know, like a graph like this. And what you're gonna do on this axis is not plot pressure but P over Z. And on this axis, you produce the gas produced and actually be careful to put proper zeros here. Okay, so the very first value you're gonna get is GP is zero. Uh, the pressure is high initially. So PI over ZI is some, some so that's PI over ZI. Then as we produce more fluids, the pressure decreases and P over Z will also decrease. If it obeys material balance, it's gonna do so you're going to have some points like this. So these are your actual points. So as you produce more fluid, okay, your pressure decreases, your GP goes up. So you have something here that clearly has a negative slope, right? And we can see that. So now what we can do, and we can do some uh, clever things here, is you want to plot the best fit equation of a straight line through these points. And of course, uh, that okay, so that's my best fit straight line okay. and the brilliant thing about that is if you extrapolate a best fit straight line through this until p equals zero at p equals zero okay you've got g so the purpose of this p over z plot and it's something that is used universally in the oil industry. So you have a gas field, often maybe a small gas field, there hasn't been a detailed seismic survey, there's no um, very complex analysis. You have data of how gas has been produced from this field. Uh, the first thing someone say, well, have you done your P over Z plot? Okay, so what it is, is you put your production data on this plot, it's, you know, it's an afternoon's exercise and it's not even a very busy afternoon, okay? You find a best fit, fit straight line and the intercept when P over z equals zero is g it's the total amount of gas um that is underground so it tells you um an idea of how much gas you have and the beautiful thing about this as opposed to using a geological estimate is this is an estimate related to what's actually coming out of the ground and in the end material balance is very powerful because it's based on what you're actually producing so a geologist colleague may have overestimated the size of the field and think you're going to produce a lot of gas. Well, you're producing the gas you're actually producing and what this shows is um, how much that's going to be. So just a, a, a few things. Um, you can also then predict how much gas you're going to produce in the future. Um, normally, what happens is you cannot produce down to a zero pressure because that's absolute zero. So there is normally an abandonment pressure. So I'm going to call it PA. Okay, and that nor Abandonment pressure is normally a few tens of atmospheres, right, or tens of bar. You might say, well, well, why is that? Well, remember, you've got the field at low pressure, the gas has to flow into the well bore, it has to flow to the surface, it often has to flow through the facilities. Um, then to transport it, often gas is transported by pipeline, there needs to be some pressure in the pipe. pipes. Obviously, you can pump the gas, but that comes at a cost. So we normally abandon a field of a few tens of atmospheres. And so you can actually work out here, you can work out how much gas you'll finally produce. This will be say your GP at abandonment and your recovery factor, which is the, the fraction of the gas you produce is GP at abandonment over G. And this is typically something that's about 90% or more. Okay, so you can have a recovery that's 90, 95% in this type of field. And the abandonment pressure, you might say, well, that's just plucked out of thin air. Yeah, it is from a reservoir engineering calculation because that's to do with the facilities and the pipelines. That's outside the scope of this course. Okay. Um, why might you want to do this? Well, it's very useful if you discover a gas field 
that you're producing gas, what do you do with the gas? If you're in a place like the North Sea or many other parts of the world, there's a pipeline infrastructure, so you simply put the gas into the pipeline. But in many other parts of the world, that doesn't exist. And so to, to invest in a pipeline infrastructure, you've got to know how much gas you have, how much gas you're going to produce. And that pipeline might be used to, for instance, fuel a power station. Last thing, um, I said, well, maybe your geologist colleague um, thought that G would be a lot bigger. So let's actually indicate this. So imagine the geological estimate of G was right up here, right? And this was from the geologists. Okay. So you start producing the field and it's entirely consistent with a much smaller field. Okay. Um, now, geological estimates have some uncertainty, so you need to put some error bars here. You can't just say, well, it's not exactly the same, right? And those error bars are often very large. But imagine it's inconsistent. The field is basically uh, much smaller than you thought. Now, you can't just say, oh, well, the geologists were wrong because this looks like bad news. You're, you're losing money here. You expect to have a bigger field, uh, sell more gas, and you're selling less. So, as I said, bad news. So what do, you, what do you do? So you've got to reconcile it. The obvious reconciliation is that, in fact, the gas is compartmentalized. So you're drilling a well here. There is, a, say, a fault, something that seals the reservoir, right? So this is fault. I'll write down the key word. So the key feature is compartments, and you can make a really long word, uh, this compartmentalization, the having of compartments, the having of barriers to flow, so that when you produce gas here, you're producing this region of the gas field, but not here because there's no flow across the fault. So how you might go about this, you say, look, a field looks smaller than we think, We've got to do something about this. We've got to interpret this. Maybe go back to the seismic survey. Do you see some faults in the seismic? And maybe the geophysicist said, yeah, we did, but we sort of tried to be optimistic and we assume that there'll be flow across these faults. You know, it's going to be okay, and it's not okay. So what it would indicate then is that you should drill another well, clearly, at the other side of the fault. And you need to drill another well. That comes at a cost. There is some uncertainty there, but that may allow you to uh, produce the entire field. The other possibility, and actually funny enough, a more risk, is what happens if your geologist's G is too small. So your field appears to be bigger than you think it is. And the reason why that's risky is you thought it was going to be a small field. It turns out to look like a big field. Everyone's happy. You know, your boss is getting a bonus. You're producing more gas than you thought. And you stop thinking. Okay. So um, why might that be? Well, it could be, again, that your geological interpretation was incorrect. It could be that there is a sort of satellite field. You often have a sort of humpy shape, your cat rock, and there's additional gas here that's actually being, that's flowing towards your well. So it could be genuinely, if you reinterpret the seismic, you actually see that there may have been other areas that contain gas that you're draining. So that, that, that is genuine good news, but it's something that you need to know and understand and got. The problem is, however, um, that quite often that isn't the case. You're just, you're just seeing a bigger field than you thought, and you haven't got an explanation. And so the, the explanation actually for it is um, to do with the water here. So I've just shown the water here doing nothing. But the reality is that as I drop the pressure, if I have a large body of water next to the gas field, the water will move into the reservoir. And what that does is the field now, in terms of its pressure response, looks like it's a lot bigger because I have a small drop, a small production, sorry, a small production. I have a relatively small drop in pressure because it, the water sort of maintains the pressure by flowing into the reservoir. So it looks as though the pressure stays quite high, okay, as I produce the gas. If I ignore um, the water influx, I might think I'm going to produce a lot of gas, but I'm not, in fact. The water is going to keep moving through this reservoir, and eventually will fill the reservoir, and I'll start producing water. And I'm not going to produce a large amount of gas at all. So the problem here with the P over Z plot is that you may have water influx. 
And what people say in textbooks often is, oh, well, you'll detect water influx because those points won't be on an exact straight line. So you check if it's a straight line, and if it isn't, you do something else. Well, I'm sorry. You know, people can always kid themselves they've got a straight line. And in fact, I've done this with data um, from a gas field with water influx. And, um, you do a P over Z plot, it looks like a straight line, and you get um, completely erroneous values out. So what you need to do is you need to do something else. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop. So this is going to end this particular sequence. Um, what I'm going to do in a subsequent video is I'm going to talk about how we include water influx, how we extend the gas material values to water influx.